Okay, so Postgres 9.6, or as we call it, uh, look at the elephant's trunk. Who was in here to look at the elephant's tail talk? Who missed the talk about the rest of the elephant? <laughs> okay, that's the rest of the conference, I guess. Uh, so anyway, we're here uh, to talk about Postgres 9.6. A uh, few more words about myself first. Uh, I work, as I said, I'm in the Postgres core team. I'm one of the committers. Um, I also do a lot of work for Postgres Europe, such as running our version of events like this. Um, when I don't do community, you know, unpaid community work, uh, I also have to make money somehow. I work for a company called Red Pill Intro. Uh, we're an open source services business centered in the Scandinavian region. Uh, we've, you know, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, some things in Germany and things like that. Uh, I'm out of Stockholm in Sweden myself. So I guess I'm the one that Stephen called out in the opening session because I don't think, is there anyone else here from Sweden? Okay, then it was probably me. No. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> we do lots of things. We do, uh, Postgres is one of our focus products where we do all sorts of you know, consulting and support services and custom development and things. And that's basically what I do there. So, enough about me, let's talk about Postgres. So, who's already using Postgres 9.6, uh, let's say in production? Oh, come on, Robert. <laughs> You've been using it for a year now. <laughs> okay, well, it'll get there. Uh, who's you, who has used Postgres 9.6 for testing or anything like that? Okay, that's at least a couple of you. It's all good. Uh, so for those of you who aren't entirely familiar uh, in Postgres, well, this is basically the, the cycle of how we built Postgres 9.6. Uh, every project has their own way, obviously. They all boil down to basically have some sort of cyclic uh, mythology. We call ours commit fests because we like to have our own names. Uh, everybody has different names, but the general idea is we work on developing it for about a month, and then we spend a month doing review and committing those. That's what we call the commit fest. And then we just do that cycle over and over again until a new version pops out at the end. And they're all, the general idea is we're supposed to do that for one month of each. Now, what has happened in the past couple of years is we've mostly been in continuous review and commit mode, and this hasn't entirely worked. It got a little bit better for 9.6, but uh, it's not perfect yet. It's far from perfect. We have so many contributors and so many contributions that we have a hard time reviewing and accepting all of them. So we need more help with that. Uh, but if you look at 9.6, what basically happened is on June 30th last year, we branched off 9.5. And the way that we work in the Postgres repositories is we branch off 9.5. We call it release 9.5 stable. We claim it's stable. We can argue whether it is at that point, but it's supposed to be stable. And then we open the master branch for developing of the new version, in this case 9.6. And then we ran uh, five commit fests in July, September, of November of 2015, in January and in March of 2016. And then the idea is, of course, the last one will take a bit longer. Then we went to beta versions, and the current state is in September, so just a few days ago, on September 1st, we put out the first release candidate. Now in Postgres, when we put out the release candidate, the general idea is it actually is a release candidate. Like, we would feel at the time comfortable shipping that version. Of course, we have fixed bugs since that, because you never know all of them. But compared to some other products, uh, that will put out the release candidate because marketing says you have to put out the release candidate. Uh, Postgres, we already put out an extra beta version because we didn't feel we were ready for the release candidate that was supposed to be out at that point. So once you get the label release candidate on a Postgres version, we really consider it, it's supposedly done. Yes, there are still bugs in it, but there are still going to be bugs in the release as well. Right? Uh, so you could, you should start well, you should start testing already on beta versions. Please do. Uh, but once you hit release candidate, it's definitely something that we feel comfortable with you putting into your systems and putting into production. The idea is we're going to have this release out pretty soon. Uh, I think the latest is we're not currently planning another release candidate. So right now it looks like the next thing that's going to come out is going to be the release. This can change later today when someone finds a bad bug. Right? But the plan is right now that that's what it is. So, which means we need testing. We need to find those last things. So please help us with that. Uh, please download the release candidate and put it on your systems. Okay, maybe you don't want to put it in production today. You can wait until maybe Friday because you always want to you know, upgrade production on Fridays. Just make sure you do it in the afternoon. Uh, but 
run your tests. Right? Take your application. If your application has tests, run those tests, but with Postgres 9.6 as a backend. The earlier, if you can come back to us and say, hey, it breaks, or saying, or even just saying, hey, we ran the tests and it doesn't break, or letting us know, is it faster, is it slower? We might have put a performance regression in for something that you were doing that we didn't realize. The earlier we can get that information in, the more likely that we can fix it. Uh, so especially if that happens now, the next time you will know to start doing that on the beta version. Because uh, at this point, we're close to release, but it's still better to get those fixes in now than to get them in after the release. It helps both us and it helps you. So if you have tests, or even if you don't have formal tests, just run your things on it and see what happens. There are not supposed to be, I don't think there are at this point, any sort of known, actually, bad bugs in RC1. But again, might change this afternoon. It might change after you have run your tests. So let's focus on the actual new features. Uh, I do these talks for every new version, and I always somewhat struggle to divide the, the new features up into groups. But I've tried this time. I've, I'm doing a, a section on DBA and administration, um, a developer and SQL features, where where's the difference between a DBA and a developer, really? Can you argue where that is? Uh, the distinction I've used is basically, well, is it exposed through SQL? Then it's more of a developer thing, unless it's monitoring. Uh, special section on replication and backup, and of course, everybody loves performance. So we'll add some specific things about performance uh, as we get towards the end. But let's start with the DBA and administration. And I'm gonna start with one of those features that are really small, and I'm not sure, I can't even count the number of times that people have asked for this feature for a long time, and it's kind of silly that we didn't have it, but now we have it. We have the ability to set an idle in transaction timeout. So previously, what you've had is you've had a statement timeout in Postgres, right? So if a query is running, we'll kill it after 30 minutes or 12 seconds, or depending on what your system looks like. But if you actually opened a transaction and ran something and just left it there, this actually causes a problem, or can cause a problem over time in Postgres with you know, accumulating uh, table bloat and index bloats and things like that. You can now set a timeout on that. Of course, I, I think this may be the longest parameter name we have. It's set idle in transaction session timeout. Uh, for next version, we're gonna try to come up with something even longer. But we're eventually gonna hit some limits in, in the parser there. Uh, so basically, in this case, you set idle in transaction session timeout to 5,000. That is 5,000 uh, milliseconds, so five seconds. Any transaction at this point that stays idle in transaction for more than five seconds will get killed. The difference here also with previous where we had statement timeout is that idle in transaction timeout will actually kill your session. Statement timeout will just abort your statement, but you will still have a TCP connection. This will actually kill your TCP connection as well, because we have no way of synchronizing the state between the client and the server so that it knows that it's no longer in a transaction while thinking it was in a transaction. And that could be very dangerous, so we just kill it. Um, setting it to something as low as five seconds might not be the best idea, but for a lot of cases, I've, when I've discussed this with people, they're like, well, I'll just set it to an hour. Like, that's never supposed to happen. That means something went wrong. I might as well kill it. Do that, and then also set up something to monitor your log files where we'll write the log saying, we just killed it for you, so that you actually realize that it's happening. If it's happening because one of your DBAs or developers accidentally left a session in the database and went for lunch or a holiday or something like that, then it's not a problem. But if it happens from your application, you probably want to figure out why it actually happened. But this way you can have it terminate and you don't have to figure that part out yourself. Um, we've added a number of improvements to PGStat activity. We also figured it's been too long since we broke all your monitoring scripts last, uh, which is when we renamed the procpid column, uh, so we did it again. Uh, basically, all your monitoring scripts are now broken. Well, maybe not all of them, but many of them. Uh, there used to be a column in PGStat activity that said waiting, that could be true or false, that indicated whether this session was blocking on a lock somewhere. That column doesn't exist anymore. So if you were monitoring for sessions that were blocking, that monitoring is now broken. Uh, of course, the idea is to make it better. We used to have a Boolean. Now we have two separate columns that will give you a lot more information. We have a wait event type 
and await event. Now, in the simple case, to do the same thing that you did before, which was basically you know, select the rows where waiting is true, you would say where wait event is not null. So if a session is running, then wait event will be null. If it's blocking on anything, then wait event will be something. And wait event type will tell you what it is. So for the traditional case, which, where the old one worked fine, it would have wait event type equals lock, wait event equals transaction ID. That means that this session is waiting on another transaction to finish doing something. In this case, it's waiting on a row level lock. But this one also lets us know much more detailed and low level information like lightweight locks. You can see, oh, this session is waiting to get a lock on the transaction log. This session is waiting to get a lock to extend the size of a table file. Uh, all these much, much more detailed pieces of information are available. There is a long list, if you go to the documentation, there's a long list of all the different things that these can be. Uh, for the simple thing, again, your broken monitoring scripts, if you just do the count star on blocking session, it's just compare it to is not null uh, for one of these. But digging in and getting more information about why your system is actually not running, it's waiting for something, what's it waiting for, uh, these two new columns will give you all that information. Now, wait event, um, well, it's not a, more or less, more or less, uh, more or less wait event is, is, it is a string. Well, it's an enum or, or whatever of, of a set thing. So it can be transaction ID, it can be relation extend lock, things like that. Uh, and wait event type can tell you if it's a heavyweight lock or a lightweight lock or something like this. But yeah, and it, of course, then you will have to figure out which transaction it is. And we still have PG locks to dig into the, the details. We also have uh, one other thing that's really useful there. I'm sure many of you have tried to write a query that actually works that tells you, oh, this thing is waiting. What's it waiting for? It turns out to be surprisingly hard, uh, which is why we now actually have a function for that. It's called PG blocking PIDs. Uh, so if we actually go back, this is the same session. So we can see here that PID 4026 is waiting for something. It's waiting for a, a transaction ID lock. If I then do a select star from PG blocking PIDs and put in this 4026, it's giving me back an array of the things that it is waiting for. So in this case, I can see my session 4026 is waiting for something that's happening in 4021. And then we can go into PG static activity and see what is 4021 doing. So you can do a join in there or something like that. This turned out to be surprisingly difficult to get earlier. Uh, if anyone wants a good example, look at what PG Admin does to get that. That's a very long query and it's not complete. But it's probably more complete than most of the ones that you wrote. Certainly more complete than the ones that I wrote. It's one of those things, this is a really small change that can really help you uh, figure out why your system isn't running the way that you expected it to run. Um, we've also added more in the on the topics of monitoring, we have a generic framework for something called utility command process, uh, sorry, utility command progress. Uh, and we've implemented this for exactly one command, which is vacuum. The idea is we have a framework, we should be able to do this for things like create index as well. But just the fact that you can now look at running vacuum sessions and see how far along they are. Uh, in this case, we have a, it looks, uh, it's like uh, PG stat activity or so. there's one row per active vacuum command. In this case, it told this vacuum is currently vacuuming relation with ID 16402. Uh, you'll have to look it up into that specific database to figure out which one that is, of course. Um, it is in the face of scanning the heap. It has uh, found 4425 block, it has scanned 27. It has vacuumed zero of them because this is a boring test database on my laptop. Uh, it has the index vacuum count, how many dead tuples has it run into. And you can see these numbers progressing as your vacuum is running on a large table. Obviously, you can't just take these minus each other and say, ooh, it's done 50%. It's going to take exactly you know, the same amount of further time. It's not that exact. And with the new like partial vacuums and all those things. But you can see that it's progressing. And you can generally see whether it's done 1% or 50%. It's not an exact science. But you can start seeing something more than just oh, this vacuum's been running for 10 hours. I wonder how much it's got left to do. <laughs> you know, is it gonna run for another week or is it mostly done? 
Um, so that's a really good way to peek into that. We're hoping to see more of those for other utility commands coming in as well, because there's a generic framework sitting at the bottom of it. But right now, there's PG stat progress vacuum. Uh, they'll tell you that. Uh, not really monitoring, but in the same general area, if you're building extensions or something for Postgres, there is now a view called pgconfig. It'll give you the same output as the command line tool pgconfig did, which is a lot of like, how was this Postgres instance built? But you can now query it through SQL. You don't have to have command line access. Uh, same thing, there is pgcontrol. There's a bunch of functions starting with pgcontrol. They'll get you the kind of data that you previously had to run the pgcontrol data command again, on the shell, to get that data back. Uh, you can now query it from inside SQL uh, to use in your tools, to use in your builds or whatever. Uh, these are obviously, the PG config thing is just compiled into Postgres. The PG control is retrieved dynamically from how the system looks uh, right now. So that's the monitoring side, and we had some nice monitoring of vacuum. We also have a large improvement of vacuum itself. Uh, this is one of those features that I think for those of you who have a problem with it today, this is gonna be the reason to upgrade. For the, you, those of you that don't have a problem, you're gonna be like, yeah, okay. Uh, basically, Postgres has this concept of a freeze vacuum or an anti-wraparound vacuum, that it has to run every couple of billion transactions. And if your tables were large, it takes a long time. And it traditionally has to scan the whole table. So if your table is multiple terabytes, you're looking at a multiple terabyte vacuum, even if nothing changed. Even if this is a table that nobody has touched for years, we still had to vacuum it. That's obviously very costly. The new thing that we have in 9.6 is that we now track on a per page basis. So for each 8K block, we have a bit that says, has anything on this page at all been modified since we last did a freeze vacuum? And if nothing has been modified since we last did a freeze vacuum, we just don't bother vacuuming that page. We just skip it. So if you have a table that is mostly read, we will be able to skip most of that table for even the anti-wraparound vacuums, which can save a lot. Now we still have to run it once. We still have to freeze it once, because when you write a row into a table, it gets stamped with whatever transaction ID that you're running with. And the thing with these freeze vacuums is they, go, they figure out when, uh, no, when everybody in the system can see this version of the row, and they mark it instead of with your transaction ID with a special frozen transaction ID uh, that will then be valid forever. So we need to get that done once. This can be done by the anti-wraparound firing of auto vacuum, can be done by manual, and if you load your data with copy freeze, which was added a couple of versions ago, it loads the data as already visible by everyone, it's a version of copy that's actually not transaction safe. Well, it's not MVCC safe because people can see your data while you're loading it. But if you can do that, then you can avoid the initial one. But even without that, you can still avoid all the future ones once you've had uh, one of these vacuum freezes. So if you have really large tables, this is going to make your vacuum life a lot nicer. Particularly, I've, I've run into multiple cases where doing like a wraparound vacuum of your whole database without a vacuum will take three to four weeks. It's kind of a problem when that fires every other week. Right? This will help greatly with the, those types of problems. Uh, there are a number of changes to Postgres FDW, the foreign data wrapper for Postgres. Uh, in particular, other than performance features, which we're gonna look into a little bit later, Postgres FDW can now learn to use remote extensions. Uh, in this, uh, for example, uh, say you use the um, hashing functions from PG Crypto. So you want to calculate uh, SHA-256 over some data. And you use that on a foreign table. So you do a select, you know, PG Crypto dot SHA-256, parentheses in reference foreign table. What would previously happen is we would copy every row of that over to the local machine and we would run the PG Crypto function to calculate the hash. These are large text files, we're copying a lot of data. If we could teach Postgres to know that PG Crypto exists on the other end as well, then we can push down the function call and run the function on the other node and just copy back the hash value, which is a lot smaller. And that's exactly what this does. If we say alter server and point to something that's a remote server, and then we say options, extensions, in this case I said PG Crypto and table func. So whenever we are referencing a function from PG Crypto, 
Postgres will now know that I can run that function on the other end instead of having to copy the data over and run it locally. Yes? So is that a schema is the question? The, no, it's done on an extension level. So PG Crypto is one extension, and it will then do all the functions that are in PG Crypto. Uh, and TableFunk is another extension. So it'll work for any extension. Now, it doesn't actually install them. That's an important thing to know. If you say like this, PG Crypto exists on this other server, and PG Crypto doesn't actually exist there, you're going to get a lot of errors. It only tells it that it's there. It's your responsibility to make sure that it's actually installed over there. But if you do that, you can get uh, a lot of things that previously required us to copy all the data back and just push it down and run it locally. Uh, same thing with you know, operators like PostGIS, you know, expensive geographical lookups. You can make the lookups on the other end and only copy the results back. Previously, we could only do that for built-in things because we knew the other side's a Postgres. And this only works if the other side is a Postgres. We, we're not smart enough to figure out if you put PG Crypto on your Oracle server. If you did that, I'd be interested in knowing how. So let's move over to the more SQL level functionality. And actually, that's the, the weakest side of things, I think, in this release. There are a lot of good things, but there aren't that many big things at the SQL level. Uh, probably the biggest thing is that we now have the ability to do phrase searching as part of our full text search. Uh, previously, this is what your typical full text search query would look like. We use the plain to TS query, which is the convert a plain text into a full text search query. We use the, uh, the double at sign operator. And then in this case, we just compare it to two TS vector. Normally, that would be your actual TS vector column in your table. But just for show, I'm using the result of the function. So I'm just doing plain two TS query. Does the query quick fox match the quick brown fox jump? And the answer is true. It does. But if I was actually searching for quick fox, it shouldn't be there. Right? Because quick fox is there. Only quick brown fox is there. Uh, and the thing we do there is we've added a new function called phrase to qu P TS query, which says I'm not, no longer searching for words. I'm searching for a phrase. So I'm now searching for the phrase quick fox. And it returns false because that is not in there. That requires the word quick to be directly followed by the word fox. And it's not there. So that's the simple form of how this changes. And to use that, you just need to say phrase to instead of plain to. It uses the same index. So you don't need a separate index for this. Um, this is actually a generic way of, if you see, now I'm just saying TS query, which means I'm specifying the Postgres internal TS query syntax, where the operator, we love operators, right, is let's say, less, less than dash greater than uh, returns false. That's the equivalent of saying phrase to TS query. So that's actually what phrase to TS query does is convert this to TS query that looks like this. Now, what you can also do is you can, instead of putting a dash in the middle, you can put a number there. And you can say quick less than two greater than fox. It says, does the word quick exist within a distance of two from the word fox? So in this case, it's true because there's only one word between quick and fox. If there were two words in between, it would return false. So that can let you say sort of almost exact phrase matching kind of a thing. And the upper, the, the top syntax is really just shorthand for saying less than one greater than. If it is within one of it. Uh, so this can unleash a new set of power for the full text searching uh, that you, it was previously very hard to do that. You could like combine it by doing both a full text match and then a like match as well. And it's all very expensive. And that's actually the only thing that I found like this isn't pure developer SQL level thing that's new in this version. There are other things, but they're not quite as big. So instead, let's move on to replication and backup. Uh, and once again, on the topic of breaking things for you, but this time we didn't actually break it, uh, but you've probably all been setting things like while level equals hot standby or while level equals archive. You can all stop doing that now and say while level equals replica. While level equals replica is the same as the old while level equals hot standby. The old while level equals archive doesn't exist anymore. Because with some experience we're on, under the belt since Postgres 9.0, it's been realized that the difference between archive and hot standby were usually not even measurable. 
Like there's no need to have both of them. So we retired both archive and hot standby, replaced them with replica. Now if your config files puts archive or hot standby in there, it will still work. But if you then query PG settings, it'll come back as being replica. So they are mapped over there, but if you're somehow, if your scripts are checking the configuration of a machine, for example, it will now come back saying replica. The actual level, like what, what it actually means, is exactly the same as the old hot standby. Uh, we've added a new view called PG stat while receiver. We already had a PG stack replication that you ran on your master and it would tell you which standbys are connected and what are they doing. If you run PG stat while receiver, you run it on your standby and it will tell you which master this standby is currently connected to. Uh, there can be zero or one rows because you cannot have more than one master yet, right? Uh, there can only be one master. If, there, if it's not currently connected, there will be zero rows. If it is connected, there'll be one row. It'll tell you the IP address and the connection information and all these transaction log positions in the same way as uh, pgstat replication does on the other side of the connection. Um, we've had some updates to replication slots. Uh, PG base backup can now actually create a replication slot when you run PG base backup, avoiding a small race condition when you're setting up new replicas. Unfortunately, it can still only be used for replication. PG base backup can't use it internally uh, in, in its own streaming mode. It can't use its own replication slot. Uh, we're probably going to fix that for next version. It's kind of like an emission. It should be there. Uh, you can also now reserve while directly from PG create physical replication slot if you happen to be using that one from like a provisioning script somewhere. Uh, basically, previously you created a replication slot. It didn't start reserving while until you used it the first time. Now you can tell it to immediately start reserving while, which is probably what you want. Uh, previously, you had to like connect and disconnect real quick and then it would be there, which is not very pretty. Uh, those are all the fairly small things. Then we have uh, two large changes on the replication side. Uh, the first one is we now support multiple synchronous standbys. Uh, basically, in previous versions, if you enabled synchronous replication mode, we would require one standby. You could have 10 standbys. We'd pick one and say, as soon as it's there, we release the transaction. You can now say, I need more than one. So the old syntax would be synchronous standby name equals node one. As soon as, as, soon as node one acknowledges your commit, we release the commit on the master. In the new syntax, you can say here, you know, uh, synchronous standby name equals three, node one, node two, node three, node four. It says, I want three of these. Now I think the current implementation actually means I want node one, and node two, and node three if they're connected. And if one of them disconnects, then it will switch to node four but it does actually do them in priority order. It does not do them entirely arbitrary. Uh, there's work done to make that more arbitrary coming up in a future version, but right now, uh, that's how it is. But it lets you say things like, I need it to be on my master and these two standbys. You can, of course, still have completely asynchronous standbys as well if you're, you know, have uh, replica uh, reporting standbys or something like that. But it lets you get that further. There's also yet another value for synchronous commit, uh, which is now remote apply. This is a level that's above on. So previously, if you set synchronous commit to on, we would write your commit locally and sync it, and then we'd send it to the other node, and we'd wait for on the other node for it to be written to disk and synced to disk, and then we would release your transaction. We wouldn't wait for it to actually be available in the database because then we have the asynchronous process that replayed this data to make it visible in the database. Uh, if you set synchronous commit to remote apply, we will now wait for it to actually be visible in the database on the other side. This is obviously slower. It guarantees that the data is there for slave reading. Uh, it doesn't mean, like, you still can still open a transaction that looks at previous versions because you have MVCC on the standby and all that stuff. Uh, it is actually surprisingly little slower than on in a lot of tests. Uh, most people I've talked to all, are all surprised at how it's not slower than it is, because it seems like it would be really slow. Uh, but if you need the data to be 
available for actual reading before you release your application on the master side, it's definitely worth benchmarking. There might certainly be use cases where it's going to be really slow. Uh, but in a lot of them, it's only a, like 5, 10% slower, which is not very much for gaining quite a bit of functionality. So let's move on to the last section, which is performance, because everybody wants things to run faster, right? I assume nobody would like it to run slower, except maybe those of you who you know, rent out Postgres machines by the hour, who would like things to be slower because you can charge more. I'm not looking at anyone in particular. Yeah. Uh, so this is one of the more interesting ones that I found. We have faster data time, uh, time data types output, which is one of those things. It surprises me that this fruit was still there to be picked, right? Basically, for timestamp, date, and time, output is now much faster, to the point that it can be twice as fast. If you have a single table with a single column and it's a timestamp and you say, copy this one to standard output or to a file, that is actually twice as fast as it used to be. It really shouldn't be possible to make it that much faster in you know, Postgres version 9.6, but it was. Obviously, in reality, that's not what you have. Maybe you have one of those tables, but you don't copy it regularly or things like that. But that's how much faster the output functions are. So basically, anything you have that deals with timestamp, date, and time, and that doesn't do it in binary format, will be faster. Yes, question? That was one of the major reasons why binary format was faster. That is one of the major reasons why binary format is faster, yes. And binary format is still faster, right? But the difference is much smaller. So, um, yeah, that's, and also, of course, this is one of the good things. You don't have to do anything. It'll just be faster. Uh, the best kind of performance improvements. Uh, there's, again, there's a bunch of changes in the locking, uh, which we seem to be doing every version now, to run better under high concurrency load. We have better tracing. We have these new things in PG Stat Activity uh, to track what's actually happening in the system to make it even faster uh, coming up further. There's one lock in particular that I, like myself, we've had a problem with this for a long time, which is relation extension locking. Postgres used to be when you're loading data into a table, we would increase the table size by one eight kilobyte block at a time. Then if you had 10 sessions loading data into the same table concurrently, it would just, they would all just be blocking on this lock. It would be really slow. Uh, the way it does now, it's, it just looks, basically whenever any session goes to extend, the, it looks, is anyone else waiting for me to finish extending this table? If the answer is yes, it, takes 20 times the number of people who are waiting on you and extends it that many blocks at the same time. And then releases them all at the same time. And hopefully, they will not immediately start blocking again because now they have 20 blocks to fill and not just one. And sort of like that. Uh, so basically, relation extension, if you're doing parallel loads, can be significantly faster. Uh, yes, question. So what does the 20 mean here? 20 is magic. 20 is a magic number, where basically if you set the number too high, you will start extending files and maybe wasting space. If you set it too low, you don't get the numbers. And we're not entirely sure that 20 is perfect, but in testing, 20 looked to be a good number. Uh, correct, this is 20 times the number of sessions that are currently waiting for this lock. So the more sessions you have waiting for it, the bigger chunks we will extend the table. So the, the block size in this question is eight kilobytes. Unless you have recompiled Postgres with a different value, but eight kilobytes is what everybody uses. Uh, so we have checkpoint sorting, whereas previously uh, what Postgres did was we wrote sequentially to the transaction log and then we wrote things to memory. And then we have this checkpoint that runs in the background that would just write things out to disk in the order that it happened to be stored in memory, which basically generated completely random I.O. Uh, what 9.6 will do is it will sort it by table space, file, fork, and block to generate, well, it's not sequential I.O. because it's going to be a lot of skipping, but more sequential, less random I.O. than before, and try to write it out in order. Now this working together with the next feature uh, can help us a lot, and that is that we have now the ability from inside of Postgres to control the kernel write back cache. Uh, those of you who've worked with large 
Postgres databases with large amounts of cache memory know that we've had this wonderful problem where Postgres would try using this uh, checkpoint spreading to spread out its write nicely from the checkpoint in the background, and we would, they would all go into the kernel cache, and then at some point the kernel would decide, hey, it's time to flush the cache, and it would write everything out as fast as it could, and your I.O. would stall and everything would be slow, which is very annoying. What we could do was we could configure these things like this dirty background ratio and dirty background bytes that have these wonderful defaults that used to be something like 30%. So if you have 64 gigs of memory, it would just write 20 gigs of data in one go to kill all your system. Uh, what Postgres is doing now, it's moving this knowledge into Postgres. So we can now configure this in postgres.conf. Now this is eventually going to be more platform dependent. Right now it's only enabled for Linux. It's not that it can't be enabled for other things. It's just that's the one where we have all the da most data. That's the one that it's got initially. And the general idea is it's usually better to force your operating system to flush data more often to get a more uh, evenly spread out load. Uh, one strong exception for this is if you actually have a case where your database does not fit in shared memory, but it does fit in the operating system cache. In this case, we never need to flush the data uh, from the Postgres side because we know we're never gonna do reads because it fits in memory. Uh, the big problem with it is when the operating system cache starts flushing and Postgres tries to read something and that read gets stalled. But if we know we're never making that read, then we're fine. But most people aren't in that case. And if you're in that case now, maybe you're not in that case tomorrow when your database grows. So what we have for this are currently three parameters. There is checkpoint flush after, BG writer flush after, and backend flush after. The default says uh, checkpoint flush after is 256 kilobytes. So when your background checkpoint has written 256 kilobytes, it'll issue a synchronized command to the operating system saying get this data to disk now. That's a lot less than the 30 or so gigabytes that it could have happened to be before. Yes, please. Uh, what is the specific synchronized command it's making? That depends on your configuration file. It could be fdata sync, it could be fsync, um, it could be one of those. Um, we have BG writer flush after, which is 512, that's if the BG writer is making the write, and we have backend flush after, which is if it's the backend itself. Now, we really don't have enough data to give any sort of tuning advice on this yet. So I would say, unless you have a really big problem, you probably wanna leave these at the default. <laughs> but we are interesting, if you have a system where you have a large amounts of memory and large amounts of IO, to get feedback on which of these numbers are actually good. <laughs> which should go up, which should go down. Uh, we just need lots and lots more information. Hopefully, if it turns out that these are always good numbers, maybe we can remove these parameters some point in the future. Right now, we just don't know enough. So we need your help with real world systems to get the data back on what are the good numbers. Okay, we have some changes performance wise in the Postgres FDW again. You can now control the fetch size. How many rows is it going to fetch in each call to the other side? It can be configured on a per table basis or on a per server basis. This used to be hard coded 100 rows. So fetch 100 rows at a time. You can now say, I know that I'm always querying small number of rows, get a smaller batch of rows. <coughs> Excuse me. Or you can say, get 10,000 rows because I know I'm gonna look at large amounts of data. It's fairly simple. Um, We've also got join push down. So we can push down normal joins, we can't push down anti-joins and semi-joins, but this means if you're joining two tables who are on the same foreign server, previously we'd basically copy them both back and join locally. We can now push and run the join remotely and only copy back the results, which hopefully means we're copying a lot less data. We can also push down ordering, which means both if you do a select from an, a foreign table saying order by, we can run the order by on the other side. Particularly interesting if you're, for example, combining it with limit or if we're using it as the input of a different step of a query plan that needs sorted data, we can push these things down. And we, don't, uh, we can now make direct updates and deletes. We used to always do a select for update and then send the update. We can now do an update immediately. These are also things that will just you know, automatically run faster. Obviously, the join thing will just enable you to do things with Postgres FDW that you previously couldn't do. Now, performance-wise, probably the biggest feature that's gonna show up is parallelism. Uh, 
because today, you know, we have uh, parallelism is interesting for CPU intensive workload, and as I'm sure you all know, in Postgres we have the collection of one query runs on one CPU. So you have one query and you have like one CPU running it and the rest of your 95 CPUs are all idle. Well, this one query runs really hard on one of your cores. Uh, and most of us have a lot of cores now. Now parallelism is a big thing, and there is a lot left to do in Postgres parallelism. It is in no way complete, but we have some things that are really, really useful. At the very bottom of the stack, we have something called a parallel sequential scan. This will underpin pretty much everything in parallelism. What it basically does is scanning a single table, as long as we do a sequential scan, we can just split it up into multiple workers. So say we have a 100 gigabyte table, we can say let's start four workers and have each of them do 25 gigabytes. And they will each run on one CPU core. And we can push down function scans, filtering functions and target functions, as long as these functions are marked parallel safe. So we can push down a where clause to run parallel in these four. We can run our um, SHA function in parallel. I think that one's marked parallel safe. Uh, and it's the foundation of pretty much everything else because we can then feed the result of this sequential scan further up into the, the query plans. Now, we have parallel aggregates. because Aggregates are also very often CPU bound. The idea here is we can do partial aggregation in each of these four workers. So we have our parallel sequential scan feeding data into these parallel aggregates, still parallelized across four or more sessions. And then we need to combine them at one point. So if we're doing like a sum, is a very easy thing to parallelize. We can sum individually and then we just sum the sums. Uh, there are other aggregates that don't work. Today it's basically most built-in aggregates works except the string aggregates, the JSON aggregates, the XML and the array aggregates. And also nothing works for ordered sets. Because these are much, much harder. It doesn't mean that we couldn't eventually have this, we just don't have it yet. But these are most of your normal aggregates are fully supported on parallel. If you've written your own aggregates, you need to add more support functions to them, but there's nothing that prevents your custom aggregates from being parallelizable as well. That was, my that was your question, okay, good. <laughs> uh, we have support for parallel joins. Uh, again, it's all based in a parallel sequential scan. So if you have this big table and you're joining it to a small table, for example, and you have a four-way parallel sequential scan, then each one of those will join its piece of data to this smaller table, each in the separate worker, and then we feed it all back into one finalized step. Uh, we currently only support nest loop and hash joins. We don't support parallelized merge joins, which would be awesome to have. I'm sure we will have it eventually, but we don't have it now. There are some other restrictions on when parallel joins just don't work. This is a lot more complicated than just scanning a table in, in four ways. Plus, this could be part of a much deeper query plan, of course, where part of the query plan can be parallelized and part of it can't. Now, there are a few things here, and I think I have the names, names right here. Uh, we've changed the names of these parameters for a few ways. There is a global parameter called max worker processes. That sets the global number of maximum background worker processes that we can have in Postgres, and parallelism uses these. So if this one is low, then you will get no parallelism. If you set it higher, you get more. Now, obviously it takes global resources and, and things like that, so you'll, you'll wanna find a balance there somewhere. Then there is, again, the wonderfully named max parallel workers per gather, which, you know, that's, what it, that's the kind of a name that a committee comes up with. Uh, there were many suggestions, and that's the one that everybody has said. That's for each individual query, how much, how many levels of parallelism can we put on it? And it's basically, you have a master process, and then you can have processes under it, and this is how many processes under it can we have. It's still limited by max worker process. You can't go above that. But if you support like 20 background workers, and you set 20 on this one as well, then one single query can take all of your background workers, which you probably don't want. Yes? The default now is to be non-parallel. Uh, it used to be during beta that parallel was enabled by default because we wanted to get more testing, but for the release, this is disabled by default. You also have costing parameters, parallel setup cost and parallel tuple cost to feed into the query planner. If you set force parallel mode to on, just don't do that in production. <laughs> it's good for testing to make sure that things work, but it's not something that you wanna do that. 
Uh, you can control the number of parallel workers on a table basis to say how many parallel workers can scan this table. Default is it tries to dynamically define this based on the size of the table. If you want functions to be pushed down, you need to mark them as parallel safe with alter function parallel safe. You need, probably need to set the cost. We've had the ability to set cost on functions for a long time. This is one, one case where it really shows up as you have to get the cost reasonably right, otherwise it might not get parallelized. So this, can, this is all things that will work. A lot of them will work out of the box. If you have extensions, if you're doing more of these things on your own, you might need to tweak these things to get your queries to actually parallelize. But remember that everything is not faster just because it parallelizes. Right? It do, it's not always faster. If it's CPU bound, it probably is. But that's not certain. It depends on what your functions are doing. OK, I'm slowly running out of time. I have a question. Do these use maintenance workmen? Work uh, no, they use the regular workmen. Yes. So the question is, is the foreign data wrapper, can it interact with parallel workers? And the answer is no, not yet. But we are looking forward to your patch, sir. Um, so I'm almost out of time and I'm almost out of slides, um, but I have one last thing. Because I'm told you're supposed to put this on your slides, right? Somebody who did much better presentations than I used to do that. So who in here has used Oracle? Who in here has run into this? OK, a couple of you. Well, we have that now, right? <laughs> You've been looking for this for a long time. Like we have Snapshot too old. Because you know Oracle is the market leader, and we want to have all the cool things they have. Uh, but there is actually, I mean, there's use, there are useful cases for, for Snapshot too old. For a lot of people migrating away from that, they're so happy they never saw it. But some people then migrated into a different problem instead. Uh, and the, pro the Postgres problem is table bloat, right? What you can set now, you can set globally, you can set uh, old snapshot threshold in minutes. And what basically happens is uh, if a transaction is running in repeatable read or higher, because it needs to do that to, to cause this problem. If it looks, if it's blocking cleanup of old blocks, we will kill it. Which is kind of what snapshot too old means, right? It's if you're blocking cleanup, the cleanup could be from a vacuum, the cleanup could be from a, a hot pruning or something like that, then the system will get killed. We don't kill it unless we have to, but we will kill it if it is doing something, it's trying to access an old snapshot. Normally, if you have a really old transaction trying to access an old snapshot in Postgres, we will let it do that forever. And we will instead block vacuum. And your tables and indexes will bloat. If you enable this, we'll say, well, up to, I don't know, 30 minutes or five minutes or whatever you set it to, we will do that. But at that, after that, you don't get to look at the old data. We kill you and we let vacuum clean the data up. For most people, if, you're, if your system is working fine on Postgres today, don't go set this, right? But if you have issues where you have to be really careful about the cases where this will help, but there are cases where this will help where you basically couldn't deal with it before. Do you have a question? I, yeah, I, I believe that's true, that it only kills you if you actually have to. Uh, we don't kill you unless you're using your old snapshot, because basically what we do is we clean up the data, and then when you come to look at it, we're like, sorry, it's not there anymore. Um, Robert? Now I have two questions. Uh, so when you say kill, do you mean like kill properly? We kill your transaction. We kill the transaction and roll it back with the error snapshot too old. And then, you, well, then you have to do rollback just like with any other. Postgres error. You're, you're stuck in this limbo state. Uh, okay. And then, so then the second question is, if you are idle in transactions and you have this on, it won't actually do anything until you at some point become unidle, right? This is correct. If you're idle in transaction, it will not kill you until you start actually doing something. If you want that one killed, you use idle in transaction timeout. Okay, okay cool. So, I'm on negative time, so I'll just say there's always going to be, infor be more features. I'm sorry for the contributors in the room where I didn't mention your feature. Uh, there are hundreds of other features in 9.6, and many of them are awesome. I had to pick a couple of them. 
Many, many smaller fixes, many performance improvements, many everything. Uh, so I'm just gonna ask for a quick show of hands for people. Which one is your biggest feature in Postgres 9.6? Who thinks it's parallelism? Okay, vacuum freeze optimizations. Okay, I can tell who ran into that problem. Uh, snapshot too old. No Oracle fanboys? Okay. Uh, multiple synchronous standbys. Okay. Uh, let's combine all the Postgres FDW improvements as a combination. Okay. Weight and look monitoring. Okay, well, anything else in particular that I mentioned here or elsewhere that you would like me to point out as being the coolest thing in 9.6? Are we looking at plans to bolster partitioning? Yes. Uh, many people are looking at this in parallel, I think. Um, so yeah, it's uh, not a trivial problem, but there is definitely work being done to improve on the partitioning. Yes? Yep. Yep, PG trigram extension has received performance improvements. It's one of those cases where, yeah, if you're using it, it's gonna be great. If you're not using it, you don't care. <laughs> but it is an awesome extension, I agree with that. Yes, that's of course the other big question. That's a good point you mentioned. The next version of Postgres will be Postgres version 10. Notice that it will be Postgres version 10. It will not be Postgres version 10.0. Uh, there will be a minor versions on it as well, but uh, currently Postgres has major versions being two digits, and we are moving to a single digit uh, major version number, starting with 10, so the following version of that will be 11. 10 will be out in about a year from now. We haven't actually decided on the development plan, but the general idea is, yeah, we're, we're sticking to the, the plan of getting a release out every year. Hopefully this release will actually come out this year, and not like, Last time when it got delayed into January. Uh, again, that's dependent on you guys to help us testing. Okay, I think it's time for me to release you all for lunch. Uh, if you have any further questions, feel free to catch me after here or just at any time during this conference. And with that, enjoy lunch and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.